So we've gone over our four basic uh, postulates, and now I have a little another table here where I'm just numbering the four different uh, effects again, and I'm I'm numbering them in this way because in some sense it's like a staircase. For some of these, you can't really have one without having the one under it. So you can't have superposition without some label for your space of states that that again is is uh, discrete for for the system in the box that we saw. And you can't have entanglement without having superposition because entanglement is just a many body version of superposition. Uncertainty you can kind of have either way. That one doesn't really matter. So on the top here, I have sort of the four big paradigms of quantum technologies. Uh, they're sort of organized into three actually. So one is sensing or metrology or imaging and everything is quantum. So you prefix quantum to everything. The other one is cryptography or communication. And the third one is computing. The fourth one here is appended as simulation. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But I guess I want to emphasize here that historically, the primary quantum effect that has been utilized in technologies has been the first one, the bottom one, discreteness, and, super, and, and in some sense, superposition. And uh, the later effects, the, so the later technologies are the ones that utilize these other effects, because these other effects are much difficult to distill and to uh, utilize in quantum systems because quantum systems are so fragile. So if we go back in time a little bit, the first technology that that utilized uh, this discreteness of energy levels or that requires discreteness to describe um, is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. So this was one of the earliest uses of quantum technologies. Another one is the laser. Resistance standard, atomic clock, principle of uncertainty, helped us detect gravitational waves. And nowadays, if we go to sort of more state-of-the-art, we have something called quantum imaging, where there's several different technologies that are utilized to enhance the your current known imaging standards like PET or uh, NMR, as well as create new ones using some of these quantum systems that are more relevant to the computing side. And collectively, you can call this quantum imaging or quantum metrology. And there's very many different proposals here uh, that are still actively studied up to date. So that's basically metrology. I want to emphasize that it's the most sort of longest studied paradigm here uh, for the application of these effects. Uh, the next one is uh, cryptography or communication. Uh, if we go back now, uh, and remember our principle of collapse, uh, we can imagine that we could design a protocol for communication that would be sensitive to eavesdroppers. Namely, if we could somehow utilize quantum mechanics in a way that an eavesdropper could be detected using this principle of collapse, maybe we have a way to protect ourselves from eavesdroppers. And such a protocol does exist, uh, it the 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 pre this this requires uh, basically all four different technologies, and hence it was not realized until a little bit later. The use of quantum mechanics uh, here is during these what's called the key generation stage of this protocol. So in order for us to communicate securely, we need to generate a key. To generate this key, we need to make sure that the eavesdropper doesn't know it, and we can utilize quantum mechanics to utilize entanglement and uncertainty. Um, to in superposition um, to generate a key such that both you know you and the communicating party know the key but any eavesdropper that comes in and tries to intercept the key as you're generating it will get caught because of the collapse principles of quantum mechanics now i can't the reason i have to use this scheme is that if i just send you the key on an on the initial communication line that's assumed unencrypted the eavesdropper will just know the key because the initial line is unencrypted. So we have to encrypt it, but to encrypt it, we have to generate a key in a way that the eavesdropper doesn't uh, gain access to it. And using quantum mechanics, we can do so in a way that if an eavesdropper tries to access it, we will know and we can stop. Today, there's many different commercial devices that do this and the state-of-the-art uh, key distribution has been done in order of hundreds or thousands of kilometers in both optical fibers and in free space communication. So that's hence this line here. We mentioned several different uh, technologies here. They're basically utilizing small quantum systems. One, two atoms, um, not very many. But I told you that 
entanglement here is a property that is present not just for two particles, but you can write states like this with two commas for three particles, four particles, etc. And you can have something called many body entanglement. And the more particles you include, the harder it is to control. But the more particles you include, the more different possibilities of states you can have. Now, let's say each particle, each subsystem has two states. And this means when you add a subsystem, you double the number of states because each one can be in two states. So here, this one is in two states, this one is in two states, two times two is four. You have a nice video about this uh, by somebody from Rigetti describing these states in terms of bits. So you have to think of that number of doublings each time. And showing that the number of possible bits doubles every time you add another coordinate to the bit string. Same is true for generic quantum systems, generic quantum many body system. And utilizing many body entanglement is harder to do. It's not something that these technologies have really utilized. They have utilized entanglement, but they've utilized entanglement between maybe two, three, only a few bodies. Utilizing really many body entanglement is something that only the most recent quantum technologies have really been able to do. And some of these, of course, these are the ones that are involved in quantum computing and quantum simulation. Quantum computing, you can probably already imagine by the words, is that it's a way to, to do some sort of computation to get a result using a quantum device using these four principles that I covered. Quantum simulation is something that's very similar, but it requires less uh, fine-tuned precision. Uh, quantum, the, the, the purpose of a quantum simulator is, is to design a many-body quantum system that can emulate or simulate another quantum system that you're interested in studying, but that is not readily available in nature. It's not quite a computer. It doesn't need to be a computer because it's not doing some particular calculation. It's not doing some algorithm uh, that, that's, that's spitting out necessarily some precise number. It's just trying to simulate another system that we're interested in studying. So for many body quantum systems, what are the ingredients that we usually use? Well, I mean, we just use the ingredients that are available to us. And uh, these are nothing but atoms, ions, which are just charged atoms, photons, or electrons. It's really all we have, and so we stack these up in some way that we can, do what we can, control them in some way we, that we can control them, and uh, the process of stacking a bunch of these up and maintaining the level of control that you need to utilize the four different uh, features of quantum mechanics that I mentioned is called scaling up. It's very hard. These systems are fragile. If you make them super big, they're going to collapse to a classical state like we humans do, right? I'm not in a quantum superposition as far as I know, right? Uh, where are we now with this? Uh, let's call n the number of systems here. And we have been able to scale up to roughly hundreds of atoms. Uh, we have about 50 ions. We can do hundreds of photons. And through something called superconducting circuits, we can use electronics to construct quantum systems that have roughly hundreds of electronic-based qubits. Now, these do utilize electrons, but the jargon that you may want to know about is superconducting circuits. The reason I highlight this is because this is sort of the most dominant technologies that companies are currently using, uh, like IBM and Google. And these quantum systems are just supercooled you know, circuits with an inductor and a capacitor and another thing, another sort of inductor that acts in a, in a, in a non-linear way relative to sort of the, the, the way an inductor is supposed to act, just some beefed up inductor. And these things are cooled. These things are on a chip. These things are cooled. These things are small. And so they're quantum. And you can have hundreds of these on a chip. We're very good at making chips. And uh, this uh, technology is what has been used to achieve something with a quant with one of these quantum devices that at least shows that they are indeed quantum, which is called quantum supremacy. I remember from the previous video that a qubit is a quantum bit. Um, yes. So would, you've mentioned atoms, ions, photons, electrons, and a dominant being electrons. Would one, say, electron be one qubit? Is that how it works? No, it's unfortunately a lot, a lot trickier than that. Really, the word electrons is not really used to describe these things. Um, 
it's a whole another lecture. But uh, so I just think when you say, "Oh, we can say do hundreds of atoms, or we can do fifty ions," I'm just wondering, does that mean hundreds of qubits or fifty? Do you see what I mean? Yes. This this little n here is the qubits. is the number of qubits that are based off of these of these technologies. Okay, of I see. these technologies. Right. Great. And in the first. Well, in the first two cases, we do mean hundred at. There is really one qubit per atom. Okay. Uh, and and in one qubit per ion, um, because we store things in sort of the low lying states of these atoms or ions. In the case of photons, also roughly, you can say that a photon stores a qubit. In the case of electrons, you're really storing information in pairs of electrons because electrons themselves are pretty, uh, uh, you know, they're they're they behave very differently than than when they do when they pair up. And uh, you basically by electrons here, I really mean electronics, uh, quantum super cool circuits, uh, like you know inductors capacitors that we have in electronics class, but they're cold and small, and they utilize another um, another nonlinear circuit element called the Josephson junction that we don't utilize in our electrical plugs. So, so with the uh, with quantum ele electronics, what has allowed us to achieve uh, quantum advantage or quantum, as it was originally called quantum supremacy, which is just roughly the ability of a quantum system to do something faster than a classical one. Now, I'm not saying it's doing anything useful, but it is doing something. And what does that do if we can show it? Well, we then we know the system is at least using some quantum features. Right, because otherwise it would be classical, and other, and then we can we can simulate it classically on a classical computer just as fast as this um, quantum device was doing. So what is the task? Well, again, roughly, if we go back to these effects, then this effect of collapse allows us to basically become statisticians. So we can induce a collapse by looking at the system from various different directions, and every time we do this, we get some outcomes with some probabilities. So we get a snapshot uh, of the system when we look at it and we get uh, a bunch of outcomes um, for each of our subsystems. So here we only have one, but you know you can imagine having 150 and you get 150 different outcomes. So that's that when we do a collapse like this, we get a sample uh, of outcomes. We run this this whole process again, we get another sample. So we can collect statistical data about our system by looking at it from in various ways and getting outcomes out. And the types of outcomes, the distribution, the statistics of these outcomes uh, can be used to discern if the system is really quantum or if it's just some random person in, inside the quantum computer flipping coins. So I've showed you four basic features of quantum mechanics that have been harnessed to make many different technologies uh, that some of which we use today and some of which we hope to use in the future and uh, listed uh, the technologies that people uh, have been uh, using. So classical physics hasn't been standing still throughout that time. There, in fact, classical computer scientists and classical cryptographers have observed the development of these quantum technologies and have developed in response new classical stuff. So for example, here uh, in quantum key distribution, it's a way to allows us to communicate securely. And there there's another algorithm called Shor's algorithm that quantum computers are most famous for that allows us to break another protocol that allows us to communicate classically that you use to log into your bank called RSA. And in response, there's been a new wave of cryptographic protocols that uh, beat RSA in the sense that they are supposed to be or postulated to be resilient to quantum attacks. So this is called post-quantum crypto. And these are classical protocols that uh, people attempt to show are uh, impossible or very difficult to hack using a quantum computer. And NIST is uh, sort of leading the, the the standardization of these protocols in the same way that they were leading the standardization of the RSA-based classical protocols that we currently use. On the uh, computing side, um, there's often, the uh, quantum algorithms often use different uh, ways to perturb the system and that, that basically translate to different quantum data structures, so to say. But some of these data structures and some of these processes can actually be peeled off from the quantum system and distilled into a classical system. 
And that has led to the establishment of quantum-inspired algorithms that classical computer scientists have developed, some of which uh, wind up beating the initial uh, algorithm that was designed to run on a quantum computer. The beauty of this large swath of quantum technologies is that they allow us to learn new things about that we can do with classical systems. And so there's this ever-present sort of push and pull in competition between uh, quantumists and uh, people who are able to do classical uh, computing and uh, classical algorithm design, um, such that uh, we we help each other become better at doing certain tasks. Now, sometimes uh, it's you know you 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 may become better at doing a specific task with some specific number of qubits, but you may not be able to be to overcome this exponential wall uh, that you get with with uh, some classical algorithms that you can overcome only with a quantum algorithm. But in other cases, um, people have shown that you can indeed overcome the exponential wall. Uh, using a classical algorithm only. So it's a very nice and fun time to be in the field because uh, we're not really uh, certain of what kind of power quantum computers uh, can be harnessed for. And uh, there's still room for uh, potentially harnessing them for a lot more. Certain quantized or discrete that, energies. The word quantum even comes from this one simple system that we can demonstrate this with is called a particle in a box. We can also think about trying to limit the probability of success or failure or the probability of certain extremes. I think we can talk about that later.